now. So everything yeah. everything from here on out is on the record. So I won't tell anyone about what you just said to me before this moment. Okay. Um, and everyone's joining. <laughs> Hello everyone. Good to see you all popping up there again. All the familiar faces and always some new faces. We're just gonna, as per usual, how are you Mike? Thanks for the wave. <laughs> um, as per usual, we're just gonna give it a minute guys to make sure everyone's set up and joined properly and we have, we've caught any stragglers. Um, you're in for a real treat tonight. There's gonna be a, a really exciting um, virtual element to this, to this tasting, so. Um, It'll be quite unique. For those of you who were on the Nika tasting last night, I hope you didn't miss me too much. Um, so there's a few more people now coming into the waiting room. Yeah, four more people joining. <clears throat> so there's one fellow, oh, and another one. Once these last two people come in, guys, we'll get going. Marvellous. So for those of you who are, who are joining us for the first time, everyone, um, my name's Luke Crowley-Holland. I'm the general manager at the Irish Whiskey Experience in Celtic Whiskey Bar and Larder down in Clarny. We're the world's uh, largest collection of Irish whiskey and the largest whiskey bar in Ireland, 1,500 whiskeys. Uh, we have a restaurant we're super proud of, a fantastic kind of bespoke cocktail menu, loads of craft beer, and, and we also do uh, whiskey tastings with the, with the Irish whiskey experience, which is what these virtual tastings kind of evolved from once COVID hit by August, kind of in, in June, July, when we were reopening, we sort of said, what can we do to get the, the Irish whiskey experience back open? Because we couldn't safely offer it with, with the social distancing and everything. Um, and it turned into this and it's, it's been a massive success and it gets even better when we were able to be joined by people like David and Ollie today, um, you know, uh, an owner and a distiller joining us, which is, you know, not, not, not an everyday occurrence on these virtual tastings. So thank you so much, folks. Um, why don't you introduce yourselves to everyone? Yeah, no problem. So um, hope everyone can hear me. My name is David Raythorn. Um, so my, my background is I, I was a software developer in college. I set up a software company um, which became Helix Health. And I sold that business in 2014 and um, set up a private equity company called Causeway Capital. And along the way, um, myself and some of the investors in, in, in the software business decided to set up a whiskey distillery, which became Lock Gill. So we'll go through a bit more of the detail as we, as we, as we start whiskey tasting. Um, but maybe Ollie then can tell you a bit about his background. Oh, marvellous. Why don't you tell us about yourself, Ollie? Hi, can everybody hear me there? We can. Yep. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I can't see you, but... You can see me, obviously. Um, yeah, my name is Ollie Elkhorn. I'm from Australia originally. So I moved over here in 2008 because I just love the, the wind and the rain and the eight months of winter. Um, no, I, I married, a, married an Irish girl. And um, yeah, and then joined um, uh, Lock Guild Distillery here in 2015. Um, and since then have gone on to do, you know, training in distilling at uh, the Shed Distillery and over in Scotland at Inch Journey Distillery as well. So, um, yeah, I think what we're going to get on to straight away, because I'm sure everyone's gasping for a drink, we'll, um, we'll go straight to the first, taste, first tasting. So can everyone see their, their little, I, th I think you have little vials. I have the little miniature pack here. Lovely. And the first one we're going to try is called Anacuna. So can you see that there? It's a 14-year-old single malt whiskies. We're going to be tasting all, well, three 14-year-old single malt whiskies and then one 16-year-old, um, which will be oh. our next release. So, Anacuna, sorry? There, before, we get, before we get into that, we actually might, do you want to tell everyone the order we're going to yeah. go in? A lot of the guys like to, and, and girls, I didn't mean to gender that one, like to have, um, yeah. have, have the lineup ready, poured already. So, do you want to say which order we'll go in first? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, we're going to start off with Anacuna. The next one will be Nocnare. And then the third one will be uh, Keshkaran. And the final one, I think, is just written as future uh, release or something like that on your bottles. But that's actually a 16-year-old Madeira finish um, whiskey. So that's, that's a real special one. Um, so yeah, I hope you have them all in line there. And we can, we can stop pouring. Okay. 
These are bottled at 48%. So they're pretty warm. Um, you'll notice the color on this one is sort of like a, it's a deep copper and gold or deep gold copper sort of color there. On the nose, I'm getting, um, we get vanilla, plums, raisins, and butterscotch, and you know, you, you do get those butterscotch caramel notes. The vanilla is obviously coming from, this was, this was matured in, um, uh, in bourbon casks, so you're getting the vanilla from the, from the bourbon casks. But the finish on this one is um, a mixture of Pe uh, Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso Sherry. So you do get these, you know, the dried fruit flavors, plums, raisins, there's orange peel in there and a bit of sort of dark chocolate, but please pop up any notes that you're getting on there as well. And I hope we're not gonna to be too short between uh, the next tasting, because this one does sort of linger for, for quite a while, but my next one is only just up the staircase there, so get drinking. <laughs> well guys, as always, want to hear your tasting notes. Get them in the chat. I forgot to mention that in my little introduction. Yeah. Um, but Luca, what, is, it, is it worthwhile? Well, I can give a run through of just the background behind uh, the name of the whiskey and you know where the ideas came from, just just to give people a, 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 a sort of idea behind the branding. Um, so I'm just going to share a screen. This is not going to be death by PowerPoint, but <laughs> just give you some some ideas. So um, the, 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 if you were, if you were to go into the Celtic whiskey shop, shop and, and buy our whiskies, this is what the bottles look like. Um, there's nine whiskies in the range, but we've only released three of them to date. So as Ali said, they're called Ahru. Um, Ahru is the Irish for transformations, and that's the brand name. And then Anakuna is the first one there on the left. Um, Knocknery Nock is the is the second one, which is the one on the right hand side. And then the third one is Kesh Karm, which is the one in the middle. Um, they all essentially tell, they're, well, they're designed, um, the, the, or the brand name came from, from, as I said, the word transformation. And you can see that it's sliced into three, and that's to represent the triple distillation of Irish whiskey. Um, a, a lot of other graphics come, to, um, there, or they're a nod to the family that owned Hazelwood House, uh, the Wynn family, and that's their coat of arms. Um, and, and then it's using, obviously, uh, well, on the coat of arms, they have the wolf, so that's why the wolf is part of our logo as well. They're, they're, the, the whiskies themselves come in packaging that's designed to look like books, and the books then tell the sto tell stories r related to Celtic mythology. So there's nine stories in total. Um, they're released in three trilogies, so three sets of three. And the first trilogy is uh, the three that you're tasting tonight is called a creation trilogy, and they tell the Celtic stories of how Ireland was created. Um, and if you if you if if you if you purchase one of the one of the packs and open it up, you'll see on the left hand side it'll it'll tell the story relating to that particular whiskey. So in this case, we're looking at Kesh Karn, um, and I don't know you probably can't make it out, but there's actually a wolf on the on the front cover, and there's a line that goes around to the back, and there's a there's a, a picture of a, of of a person on the back. But essentially, this story tells. Um, of the story um, of King Cormac and how, how King Cormac came to be. And he was seen as, a, he, was, he was supposedly raised by wolves just outside of Sligo and then made his way to the Hill of Tara where he became the first High King of Ireland. But, but the reason he was made High King was they were terrified because they thought he was able to turn himself into a wolf. And consequently, because of the associations with werewolves and, you know, sort of um, Eastern Europe, um, this is essentially a whiskey that's finished in a Hungarian Tokai, um, and we're going to try that later, but, the, but that's really the, the, the story behind it. So each of the whiskeys, the finish has been chosen to tie in with the story and then all the packaging around that. So we've already, we've already tried the for, first whiskey, so I suppose at this point, if there's, if, if there's tasting notes that you, know, you, you want to throw up, um, and then you know, Ollie's then going to take us on a tour of the distillery. And I think as we, as we walk through the distillery, feel free to um, type up some questions if you want to ask, and Ollie will be able to answer any technical questions relating to the equipment that you're going to look at. Um, and then I can answer any questions relating to the, the, the you know, the, I suppose the story be, be, you know, behind, behind the distillery itself. Along the way, we'll, we'll, we'll stop and we'll, I'll show you some old photographs of the house and talk about how, the, how, how we came up with the idea of building the distillery, et cetera. So we, we, we might let Ollie start the walk and then midway through we'll interrupt and we'll, we'll, we'll show some photographs. Sounds good. Um, there's already some tasting notes in there from 
David says chocolate and plum for me. Um, great tasting note. Mariah says hazelnut or maybe praline. It is quite nutty. It's a lot for me personally. It's a lot drier and more tannic um, than than I was expecting. I, I must say, David, that the packaging is 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 really really good quality. You really feel like you're you're purchasing a, a premium whiskey. Like you know when when we are showing when I'm selling it and you show someone the, the packaging, it often sways them, especially between a lot of whiskeys in that that kind of price point. I think we're um, I just make sure I'm correct. Yeah, but 132 euros of Celtic whiskey. So for 14 year old with 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 PX and sherry cast finishing and with that kind of presentation, it's 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 not bad value, particularly in the current Irish whiskey climate. What was your kind of yeah. um, thinking around that? I suppose while we move along. Yeah, I, I, look, um, I, I suppose first and foremost, we we acquired this site in 2014, and and obviously said about building a distillery. The distillery only went live in 2019, so clearly this whiskey is not from our distillery. Where, what, what I think makes it different is um, we, we purchased this, the, the, the whiskey itself from, from Cooley. So it's, it's Cooley stock. So it's probably the same, same product that you'd see with Teelings. Um, but we worked with a distiller in Scotland, a guy called Billy Walker, who was um, voted in 2015 and then again in 2020, voted Global Distiller of the Year. Um, Billy had helped Cooley Distillery build the original Cooley Distillery and, and worked on some of the... Um, you know the, the the original sort of uh, distillation recipes, etc. Um, so Billy had not not been back to Ireland and didn't didn't had never tasted his own whiskey or what it what it had turned out like. So we brought we 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 acquired or we, we entered into a a purchase agreement with Beam and um, Suntory to to buy some of this whiskey, and then we brought Billy over to um, a warehouse in. Um, in the Midlands and we essentially sort of went through barrel by barrel and Billy selected all of the barrels that he wanted which was 522 barrels and um, so it took us a bit of time to do that yeah. <laughs> um, and and we took those barrels down to Sligo and then on you know w- with Billy we we then he specializes in sherry finished whiskies um, and he's won he's won like awards to beat the band um, for his finishes. So uh, Billy himself, he, he owned, at the time he owned Ben Reoch, uh, Distillery, Glen Glossock and Glen Dronock. Um, and he sold, he sold those and then he bought a new, um, a new distillery, um, Glen Alkey. So he, he, he's in his 70s, um, but he's back distilling again. Um, so Billy selected all the individual barrels and then he got us to put them into different barrels that we acquired all across Europe um, to make up these nine releases. So, so you know, we, we've worked on this whiskey for the last five years um, to, to get it to where, where it is. And as I say, there's more, there's more whiskey to come. But that's the, that, that's the story behind it. No, it sounds great. We did a Glen Allocky tasting, um, or one of our first tastings before Christmas was, and it, it was a really, really impressive lineup of some really quality, um, almost all sherry cask finished um, single malts. So um, this one, so far anyway, keep, it keeps the pace just as good. <laughs> So what do you want to, to, to do next, guys? Do you want to do another slide or, or are we going to go through a bit of the distillery? Yeah, I think Ollie, if Ollie's going to take you through the milling hall first, if, you know, the first part of the process. Yeah. Um, so I'll just turn the camera back around there. Um, yeah, we're going to start, obviously, at the beginning of the process. Well, apart from the malting, which we, we get all of our malt from Minch. Um, it's all Hookhead series malt. And then it would arrive, you know, by 30 tonne, um, truckload here. There's a hopper outside the door. Just outside there. I'm not going to bring you out there because I'll lose signal. But um, we, we would then offload into the storage silos. So we've got three storage silos here. They can each take a full truckload. And then um, from there, we're up into the mill. We have a buffer bin above there, down into the mill. Um, so we're doing, you know, the mo- sorry, the, I'm sure there's people of a, a range of different um, knowledges on the, on this call. So I'll, I'll try and keep it sort of short and sweet and you can ask questions if you want to know any more details. So we're, we're the, obviously the grain is arriving as a full kernel. We then mill it down into grist and we weigh it out in the grist bin here. Um, our batch sizes are 2.6 tons and then it will go through the, uh, the first conveyor up into the grist elevator. And then from here, we switch over into the, into the brew house. So I'm gonna go up here, hopefully without tripping over the staircase and falling on my face. So <laughs> it's kind of tricky holding, holding something and, uh, and, and, and not um, 
hurt myself at the same time. So after it's milled, it's going to come through the wall here on the second grist conveyor. Oh, what have I done? Can everybody still see me okay? Yeah, you can see yeah. yeah, great. Sorry, I must have pressed a button. Um, and then it comes into the brew house here and into the louder tone. So we're using a steel smasher. And we have the grist come in from above. And that's our water line right there. So in, inside the tube there, it's beaten, um, you know, beaten together um, and then and then drops into the into the loudest one where we have rakes for raking the bed. And obviously that's where all the conversions are being done uh, from, you know, as, as starches into, into fermentable sugars. So um, we have, it, it's a, it's a 3.2 meter ton, I think it is, or 3.7. And, um, you know, we, are, we, we, can, we can rake the bed, obviously for efficiency, get it going a little bit quicker. And then it has a, a unlatchable plow bars inside as well. So you can't, it's not, it's difficult to see what's actually in there. I know just with the, uh, with the lighting, but um, yeah, this is, I'm sure some of you have already seen, seen these before. They range in sizes drastically. Mm. And, and I'm going to turn the camera back around again here. And we're going to do our, Sorry, one sec. Our second tasting. Marvellous. And why, well, before we answer that, I want to say there's one more comment there from EC. This is a whiskey that infuses the mouth and warms the palate with floral notes. So that's a, that's a great tasting note. And I must say, I added a drop of water, and for me, it got a lot more, um, a lot more Christmas spice um, once, once the water kind of helps bring, bring those out. So it's, it's a, it was a really great whiskey to start with. I hope everyone agrees. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually I'm carrying around a little, little bottle of water with me, so... Just for because it, it, it does it changes it so much when you if you if you're trying it sort of you know straight out of the bottle and then just watering it back slightly um you can it starts to just open up you can really it, it start, you notice much more of the subtle flavors um so the next one that I have here is Nocturne on this tiny little bottle here so this is once again, as, as Dave said, we, we acquired the, the 522 casks from Cooley. Um, we then, this, this one was actually finished in, in two um, Oloroso. So we had it in bots to begin with, and then we transferred into um, Oloroso hogsheads towards the end. And they're really, really rich Oloroso hogsheads. Um, and that just, I mean, it, it really enhanced it. Obviously, we, we did, I just didn't leave it in the hogsheads for too long because they're slightly smaller than the butts and they didn't need as much time to, to um, infuse the whiskey. So, but I'm just going to pour a little glass here. So apologies if this was mentioned already, but at what, what age was it when it was transferred? Um, did you say it was at 14 already by the time it was, it was transferred in for finishing or...? No, sorry. These these would have been um, eleven when they were transferred. Ah, so it's been three years. Yeah. So that's quite long. Yeah. For a, for a finish. You wouldn't normally get that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It is. It, it was. A, it was quite a long time. Um, we with the PX, we had to be. You have to be a little bit more careful because it's so so sweet. It can sort of if you, if it's left too long, it can overpower. Um, you know, yeah, you, you, this is not getting too much of the sherry flavor into the whiskey. So, but um, that's where Billy. I mean, we we have Billy Master Blender in from Glenallachie. He's just amazing. Uh, so we, we, we before we did these releases, we were able to send over samples to him. He then um, selected which casks we should use for the for the blend. And now I guess we're all, we're all we're getting better at it, where we can we can actually select the casks ourselves, and we we can actually pick now which ones are better and then we really look to Billy for his his sort of approval on them and this one's a lot more familiar on the nose almost it's um I don't mean that in a bad way I mean in in the sense that like you know when you get a good quality wine you know you know you know what to look for in it like you know and you get lots of those that kind of cedar wood that kind mm. of fresh oaky flavors and the 
the caramels and raisins are a lot more discernible than, than in the first one. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You mentioned cedarwood. I definitely get cedarwood in this as well. And um, a little bit of tobacco as well. So, but like, like the first one that we tried, it does have the, it's the dried fruit notes. Mm. Um, whereas the next one we'll try, uh, Keshkaran, you know, is the, is the Hungarian, it's a Hungarian white wine cask. It has much more of the fresh fruit flavors. So these two are probably more similar. And then the next one we try is actually very different. Madeira is obviously very different again. So, um, but on the palate, this one is, I've, I've put a little drop of water into this one, but, um, you know, you get chocolate. There's black pepper, licorice, and as you said, as you mentioned, the wood, the oak is there, and um, like raisins. So, but please do type in your comments because every, every time we do these, people pick, pick out different uh, notes. Sometimes I steal them, sometimes I don't. <laughs> but, well, Colin, Colin says I can get tobacco, especially before mixing it with water. Um, the water dulls it slightly. David said I was thinking leather as well. Tobacco was mentioned. Mm. I guess I'm hoping to get back in a comfy seat and with a cigar at some stage. So <laughs> um, not a bad shout. Um, no, well, actually, a that, lot more. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. The last one we did. Sorry. No, go on. Sorry. The, the last, the, the last uh, tour we did was with um, a company over in uh, Edinburgh who do these, they do cigar whiskey pairings um, online, which uh, you, you might have to start going into yourself <laughs> yeah well see the problem is we, we sell uh, cubans in the in the bar but everyone comes in and they spend 50 euros on these really nice cuban cigars and then they want to smoke them in the bar and you're like no you can't <laughs> you know so it's um it's always a difficult one to manage um kieran murphy says definitely oaky woody um ec says licorice notes when water was added um all fantastic tasting notes guys um okay mm. at this stage i'm going to show while you're all saving that whiskey, I'm going, to, I'm going to share the screen again, and I'm just going to give you some background to the actual project and the, and the estate, and, and maybe have a look at some photographs as well. Um, so hopefully everybody can see that. Yeah, very clear. It says second whiskey. Second whiskey, great. Okay, so... This is um this is the estate. So the, the the body of water that you're looking at in the front is called Loch Gill, um, and then the river that's down the, the left hand side of that peninsula it's called the Garavogue River, which is the shortest river in Ireland. It's uh, three kilometers from the tip here out to the Atlantic Ocean, which you can just about see on the left hand side. And the buildings that you see around in the top left is Sligo Town itself. And then in the background, you've got um, Bembulban Mountain, which is part of the Dartry Mountain Range, which is, I suppose, Ireland's equivalent of Table Mountain. Um, on the other side, which you, ca you can't obviously see here, um, you've got the Ox Mountains, and, and essentially Loch Gill sits in between those two mountain ranges. So all the water that comes from um, Bembulban and, and the Ox Mountains ends up in, in Loch Gill. And we then have a 150-meter well that's drill down into the aquifer and we take the water up from up from the ground and we, and we then treat it and that's the only water that we use um, in our uh, process so this sorry and what, what you're looking at here in, in 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 the on the peninsula itself you can see there's a lot of forest around but you've got a fairly big building there in the center and you can just about make out to the, to the north of that or to the top of that there's there's a house the house the house itself is 25 thousand square feet in size so it's quite a substantial house but it's dwarfed by this factory which is the largest building in the west of ireland it's six acres under roof um, it's a single it's a single building um, so if you just want the next slide so this is ha hazel house itself and um, so ha hazel hazel house was built, well the land was acquired in 1722 by by a family from wales called the Wynn family and um, they bought 14, 14 and a half thousand acres um, from Lord Palmerston in London, um, and it included all of Sligo Town. So they, they owned the entire Sligo Town. The reason they bought it was because they wanted access to all of the tolls and charges and taxes from the town itself. And, and that's, where, that's where they made their money. And um, so the, he the house was built sort of from the 1722 onwards. So we think around 1725 by an architect called Richard Cassell. 
Um, so Richard Cassell was brought over as a 16 year old um, from Germany to work with Edward Love of Pierce. And he then took over his practice um, when he died and he became Ireland's most uh, eminent um, architect. So he, he, he built, so Hazelwood House was the first house he built, but he then went on to build Leinster House, Rusper House, the Rotunda Hospital, Trinity College, um, Westport House, Belinter House, like you name it, every big house of the of the, of the 18th century, um, Richard Cassells had, had a hand, hand or part in it. Um, but, but Hazelwood House was the first house that he ever built. And um, this is what it looked like in the eight, sort of 1830s, 1840s, um, pro probably in, a, in, a, in its heyday. Um, and this is another picture from, from, from the other side, um, a, little, a little bit earlier. Um, and then this is the Wynn family from around about the 1820s, uh, sort of 1830s, um, hunting party, and they're sitting on the front uh, doorstep of Hazelwood House itself. So they, they stayed in the house um, from 1720 all the way through to the 1920s until, the, um, until independence. And essentially the family, um, well, the, the, the last of the family, um, the, the wife died in a, in a horse uh, buggy accident. She was thrown out of the, out of the horse drawn carriage and hit her head and died. And then the husband never remarried, but he only had three daughters. Um, and he had, there was no male heir, and as, as, as a consequence, the house um, essentially was sold. The three daughters moved over to um, Wicklow to Avoca, and they actually bought, ultimately bought Avoca Handweavers, and that's, they set up Avoca Handweavers. So if you're, if you're in Avoca Handweavers and look at, uh, you know, up in the wall, they have a bit of a history about it, you'll see that it was set up by three Wynn sisters in, uh, in the 1920s, um, and, and, and that was the, the Wynn sisters from Hazelwood House. This is um, a picture of the lake itself, um, or well, sorry, a view from the Garavog River up into the lake, and they used to race these boats. So there was a regatta on the on the lake every year, um, and these boats were, were were boats that they that that they, that they used to, to race. So all the all the families in the area used to have a boat each, and 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 they'd race these. There's a little small cup in Sligo Town in um, in the county museum, and it's the oldest sporting cup in the world. And it's from the it's from the ladies of Hazelwood House for the promotion of fast boating on Loch Gill. And these are the fast boats. So that they were fast for, the, for, for their day. Um, this, is a, this is another view of, on, on the river and you can see this little windmill. So the family were quite um, advanced technologically. So this was a windmill that, that powered a pump that pumped all the water from the, or from the river up into the house, which they used on a day-to-day on -day basis. And sorry, and this is a, a view of the, uh, of the river up the other way into, into Loch Gill itself. So this was, this was taken about you know, a, few month, a few months back. Wow, that's, that's a picture a picture down the river and um, looking towards uh, Ben Bulban. That's fantastic. We we know all about um, lakes and mountains down here in Clarney. So there there's some good lakes and mountains. I can tell you that. Um, we had a, a, a John Kinnan <laughs> in the chat. There says, "Is that the old Sheen Sheen factory?" Yeah, it's the old Sahan Media factory. What we'll do is I'll let Ollie will continue on his tour. We'll try another whiskey and I'll come back to a couple of photographs of the factory and the, the state that it was in when we bought it and then what it looks like today. And that'll be the end of my PowerPoint. No, that sounds good. One question before we move on. Is, is that the same Lord Palmerston who was, who was British Prime Minister or is it a different one? I have no idea. <laughs> You've caught me there. <laughs> and you're, you're very lucky to have um, such amazing photographs from the period. That's, that's even the 1830s. Yeah, there's a, I can't imagine they're very common photographs back then. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of photographs. I mean, the the family owned the family had their own race course, so they they raced horses. Well, there was horse races on their land, but all the people from Sligo used to come out. So there's a lot of old photographs of that type of thing. They had a um, they had a polo team, probably one of the most famous polo teams in Ireland at the time. So again, they would have uh, you know been in the house. So yeah, there's a lot of old historical documentation um, around. Fantastic. Okay, so I think Ollie's going to move on to the next uh, bit of the tour. Take it away, Ollie. Great. Um, hope you can still see me there. So I'm still here at the Ladder Ton. Um, I'll just explain for maybe people who haven't done these kind of tours before. Like, um, we're we're basically mixing uh, grist and hot water into the into the ton here, which uh, and then the enzymes inside the grain will then convert the um, the starches into fermentable sugars. So it, it, it's then drained off underneath us. So I'm actually standing um, quite high up, and that's the 
the underside of the uh, of the ton, and that's sort of where all the pipe work is. I won't bring you down there um, unless you if, unless someone really wants to go down there. Um, but basically, we the, when the wort is drained off, um, we then put it through a wort cooler. All of the we use process water on the other side of the heat exchanger to cool the wort, and then that heat is recovered into our warm well tank. So that'd be reused for. Um, we put it through the first wash still condenser and then also use it for sparging as well. So there's a lot of this. This plant was um, built by uh, Frilly in Pianti. They're based in Siena and um, it's a, it's it's designed to run 24 seven. So we're not quite there yet, but we will be in the next month and a half. We're going to we're going to be switching over to 24 seven. So um, we have nine fermentation vessels here. Um, each hold, you know, around 13,000 liters of, of wash. So the yeast is rehydrated below us as well and then pumped into the tanks. But you can, you can see down there just sort of this, this, the size of them. Um, and I'll just continue on because I'm sure everybody wants to get the next drink into them. So I'll try and make my way down the stairs here. I'm going to pan around and sort of give you an idea of the space as well, when we when we started here, I mean this this section of the building um, was just a, a complete mess. I think Dave does have a couple of slides of what it looked like before we built the distillery here, and it's 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 taken on some transformation. <laughs> Let me tell you. So at the moment we have a we have a tanker parked in here because we're storing um, spirit for somebody else, um, and. It's just packed in here temporarily, so I'll have to move my way past it. It's actually great that it's there because it gives a it gives a um, a, a good idea of the size of the thing. A bit of scale. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a thirty thousand liter thirty thousand liter tanker. That one there. So it's yeah, it is. It's it's quite a big area. You no, know, like the the middle space here is is was left for phase two. So we have capacity here to increase. The, the scale of the production um, and bring it up to 3,000, uh, th sorry, 3 million liters per annum. So this is a million liter plant um, and we can go to 3 million, which will be the plan in the future. Over on the far side there, I'll just bring you across there. It's, it's, it's not the most sexy part of the, uh, of the unit, but it, there's some really cool technology in here. So we do, at this scale, we'd use a lot of, um, uh, heat transfer from our waste products. So we store the pot ale from um, from the wash still, and we store the spent lees in the tank behind there. Uh, you know, they're, they're nearly 100 degrees when they're pumped into the tank. And then we pump them through a uh, heat exchanger for the next batch going in. As we're charging the still, they pass over a heat exchanger and we recover the heat from them before they're discharged. So it's a really cool um, sort of energy saving and um, part of the uh, of the plant and frilly are just experts in 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 all things sort of efficiency and heat recovery so um but you know on our second still we can get we can get up to distillation temperatures within 10 minutes like so it's going from 20 degrees pumped into the still and we're distilling within 10 minutes so it's it's it saves us a lot on gas um you know reduces our steam consumption as well Ali, can you spin um, back? Ali, I'm going to come back? around this side now. Ali, could you spin back around to show a picture of yep. uh, just, just show the fermentation tanks? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, Actually, I may have to stay on this side of the tanker because I think I'm gonna, I'll, I'll lose coverage otherwise. So, ju just to explain the process for. Yeah, so just explain process for people that aren't maybe 100% familiar as Ollie was saying the lauder ton is like a joint mixer it's mixing up grist which you know essentially looks a bit like porridge um, and what's coming out the bottom of the tank is is sugary water which goes into these fermentation tanks to that we add yeast and the yeast then starts to convert the sugars into alcohol heat and carbon dioxide the carbon dioxide goes up the top in those tubes so you'll see them and it's vented to the atmosphere and then the, ri the ridges on the tank contain cold water. So it's computer controlled to keep the, to essentially to keep the liquid at the right temperature for the yeast to do the max or to create the maximum amount of alcohol. So we end up with about 13,000, somewhere between 13,000 and 15,000 liters um, of alcohol in each fermentation tank. Fermentation, I think Ollie will probably correct me, but takes about 40 hours 
whereas the lauter tun operates on a six hour, four to six hour cycle. So that's why we need nine fermentation tanks. So you fill the fermentation tanks one by one for, with the lauter tun as it's been used. Um, and then by the time you get it, you, you fill nine of them, the first one is ready to be distilled and then the process can be repeated. So that's why you have to have nine fermentation tanks for one lauter tun to en enable a continuous process. And what we end up in those tanks at the end of the 40 hours, we end up with about with an with about 13,000 liters of alcohol at about 8% alcohol by volume. And that then goes on to the next part of the process, which Ollie's going to take us through now. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, as, as Dave was saying there, 13,000 liters at it's actually just over 8% we get we get out um, we get out of each each fermenter there. So and that would be called a wash. And then it's pumped across to the still house, which I'm going to bring you up to now. This is, let's um, one sec. Actually, I'm just going to stop here for a second. Use it. It gives you quite a good view of. So we're looking down the down the steam line there, and we're looking up at the stills. The first one you see is the spirit still. The middle one there is faint still, and then at the far end is our wash still. Um, and we have a recycle line. You can see that coming out of the out of the side of the still there. That then goes down. So all of the liquid inside the still is um, put through plate heat exchangers. It's a very clean way of distilling because um, you know back in the day they would have had copper coils or steam jackets on the outside of the um, of the stills. Somebody would have actually had to climb inside the still to clean them because. Uh, particularly the wash because you're, you've got a lot of proteins and um, and other sort of debris in or yeast inside the inside the still. So someone would have had to get in there and and scrub them. But we have these reboilers that we can um, we can basically put caustic through every 15 cycles. So we're here at the wash still, and as Dave was saying, we're getting us just over eight percent ABV. It's basically a very very yeasty beer. At this stage, unboiled beer with no hops in it, but um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, very, it's quite tart. It's very, it's a very tart liquid sort of thing. It wouldn't necessarily. It, it's it, it changes an awful lot in the fermentation because obviously the wort is very very sugary. It's almost like sugar on cornflakes sort of thing. It's really really sweet. Smells delicious. And then you go to wash is kind of tart and has a slightly sort of acidic um, smell to it. But when you distill that, all of those estery notes and the the um, the, the, the 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 tart notes then turn into our our congeners for. Um, for making the spirit nice. So here, this is, this is the wash still here. We're basically boiling the liquid inside here. Um, alcohol boils at 78 degrees and water obviously boils at 100 degrees. So we maintain the temperature. It's all SCADA controlled um, uh, above 78, but below 100. Um, the ethanol vapor then, uh, you, you know, it vaporizes inside the still makes us, the ethanol vapor makes its way up in the neck. We get quite a bit of reflux inside these stills. So there's colder pockets inside the neck there, um, you know, just naturally on the design and the, the, the vapor, some of the vapor will recondense inside the neck and drip back into the pot. So it's effectively sort of um, distilled several times inside the, inside the still. And then it goes across on through the line arm and into our first condenser. On this one, we use two condensers. So the first one we use as a heat exchanger condenser um, together as an efficiency thing as well. So we're pumping warm water in through the bottom um, of the condenser there and we recover that as hot water at the top and that, that's our sparge water then for mashing. And once again, it's another efficiency thing. And then we have a sub cooler here and the sub cooler is lowering the temperature of the distillate once it's completely condensing it and lowering it to the right temperature for, um, for the receiver. So I'm just gonna point this direction as well. So you can see how close we are to the house. That's Hazelwood House there through the, through the front cladding. Um, eventually that's gonna all be glass. So you can, you can just imagine what the view is from 
the back door of the house, you're looking straight onto three big copper pot stills. Um, you know, it's a ginormous building, but it's, it's fantastic to look at. And uh, it's great to see it all being modernized. Um, I'm going to turn the camera around now again. And everyone must be thirsty at this stage. Mm -hmm. Parched. <laughs> so we're going to try the third, the third whiskey we're going to try. Luke, do you have, you have your third one there, do you? Yeah, the, uh, the, the Kesh Corn. I, I poured it already. This is Kesh Corn. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure several people have. <laughs> That's it. it. So this, it, is, this is the one I, I mentioned earlier. I was going, I was going to say, Ali. Sorry, this, go ahead, Dave. This is the one that's, um, that tells the story of King Cormac, the, the, the wolf guy, um, and, and, and therefore it's finished in Hungarian Tokai casks. So it's, it, again, totally different flavor. But as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that one now. Yeah, well, actually, Luke, would, would you be able to... I, I'll give my notes as well, but maybe you could give us some of your notes just so we can... Uh, yeah. We, we can test you a bit. Um, I suppose on the nose, I think it's, it's, it's much more kind of peachy, a lot more vanilla than the, than, than the, the, the last two. Um, I suppose I'll give it a taste. I find it a lot more, well, <laughs> it packs a bit more of a punch. I don't know why, but it's almost like custard um, on the finish. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really different. Um, I must say it's, it's we've seen the Tokai cast mm. pop up a, a bit in, in, in the last few years and, and this one doesn't, didn't taste as, as I expected it to. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I probably bottled it there, right? Mm. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Yeah, definitely. You, definitely you picked up the, kind of, the lighter than the other two. Only an apple on the finish. Um, as well, like kind of like stewed apple yeah. flavor. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, that's it. I get the bit like vanilla and pear, but mm. it, it is kind of like it's a it's a nice balance. Like the finish on it is really nicely balanced, sweet, sweet and dry. I find on this one. Um, but uh, one that keeps coming up is is sort of like a lemon flavor on this one as well. So like lemon, pineapple, pear, and um, like green apple as well. And um, I sometimes get the cut, cut flowers on the smell of this one as well. So it's, it can be, um, but I don't want to, I don't want to sound too, too ridiculous as well. <laughs> you know, I like to keep it sort of short, short and sweet sort of thing. I generally only sort of pick up five notes on, on each thing. Um, I, I, I have to, I have to, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, I'm lucky enough to to see Billy's notes on them as well. So, uh, and and obviously Billy Walker, master blender, he just picks out these notes like perfectly. He uses lovely phrases like waves of honey, um, you know, uh, waves of honey or um, these fresh orchard fruits, that kind of thing, stone fruits. But um, yeah, it's lovely. I think this is probably my favorite out of the three of them, but um depends what you like if you if you like those real like the, the fresh notes in um whiskey or you know you like the real darker the darker fruits obviously they they vary a huge amount from whiskey to whiskey so um i guess what what i should say as well like our our spirit our new make spirit would be sent over to we've we've used billy in that way as well where when we were dialing in the plant um we were able to send samples over to billy and he well, actually, he didn't advise us to change any of the cuts, but um, uh, we we just sort of use use his nose, use his his knowledge to um, advise us if we're if there's anything else we should be doing to it. But uh, it's really for, for now we have uh, def definitely on the distillation plant. It's it's a matter of just batch after batch after batch. That's what we're trying to trying to hit now, and just hit the same numbers every time. Um, so, but our, our spirit would be quite light because of the amount of reflux that's happening inside the stills. We do have a light spirit. It's very fruity. It actually has, um, um, and maybe we could do this on the next one. We could do, we could do a new make spirit um, sampling. 
and we do it at 83% maybe or something like that to blow <laughs> everyone's socks off. But, <laughs> yeah, but um, anyway, I should probably keep on moving on because otherwise I'm going to... Well, Sorry, uh, David, go on. It might be worth mentioning um, how, how we came about this whiskey. Um, we, were, we were at a, an art exhibition actually in Sligo and the Hungarian ambassador was there. And I was having a conversation with him and I just asked him out of curiosity, could he get us any barrels out of Hungary? And he said, no way. But about six months later, we got a call from the embassy to say that um, he'd actually managed to get some barrels for us from a distillery called Armus in, um, in Hungary. And we duly got a, I think it was two truckloads of barrels came across. So Armus turns out is the oldest distillery in Hungary and made wine for Captain the Great. Um, so these are sort of fair, fairly special barrels. There was two sets of barrels. There was a Hungarian Tokai of white uh, dessert wine, and then a Burgundy, which is, is, is a red wine. So we, we actually, this is the white wine um, Tokai, Tokai, but we also have some whiskey in uh, red Burgundy barrels, which we're going to release later on. No, it's interesting. David uh, Morell's in the chat that says, uh, ginger in there somewhere for me. I actually thought it was a bit more spicy after adding a drop of water. And after, I don't know if anyone else on, on the, the Zoom tonight experienced this, but after adding a drop of water, it became really tannic for me, really kind of dry, um, much more so than, than, than it was at 48%. Um, definitely, it, the more it came out as well, it definitely a lot more kind of, a lot more kind of fruity, as you mentioned, the kind of real fruit, fruit salad mixed there, maybe a touch of creme brulee on the nose, that kind of like more vanilla side rather than burnt sugary side of that. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary whiskey, um, it really is um, good. Although Jared Kelly in the chat there says uh, Nocknery is his favorite so far. So there you go. Ali, are you, are you going to talk to the other two stills before you head over to the warehouse or are you just going to go to the warehouse? I can, I can give you a quick talk on the other two stills there. One second. Yeah, so um, I think I mentioned earlier, like the, the plant here was designed by Frilly. Um, there's a lot of automation in the plant, um, as a lot of modern plants are. Um, but on this, this plant, we, it's, it's semi-automated. So we, there's a lot of manual valves here. All of our cutting valves are manual. Um, all the discharge valves for the stills are all manual. Um, and the valves for the fermenters as well are also manual. But to keep the consistency right, you know, the scatter will actually pop up with messages for operators to then go and open valves at the correct time. We obviously have um, procedures for when we make cuts um, and how they're made, very specific strengths that they're, that they're cut at as well. But um, I can just give you a quick sort of look at the, the valves set up here for cutting. Um, so this is the intermediate still, and it's got three different routes that you can, you can then divert the, uh, the spirit into. Um, and it's the same valve set up on, on the spirit still as well. But um, on intermediate, we're making a small heads cut, uh, you know, quite a wide middle cut for the, for the intermediate still, and then um, a long feints cut as well. So whereas on spirit still, it's a very narrow cut for spirit. Um, and then we split the feints into, into two. So on the, on the spirit still, we actually kind of, turn it turn it into about five there's there's actually five cuts on the on the spirit um, where we can send back some of our very low feints um and stripped out feints we can send them back to the wash still so um and we found you know it, it did take some time to get that dialed in but um we found the you know the ideal setup for it for this plant and um all the feedback on it has been really really good so we just keep going um okay. underneath i might just bring you down underneath here for a second yeah no put you far away and then I'll, I'll i'll take over so just wanted to point out here i mentioned before all of the liquid comes out of the sill so it actually comes down through this recycle line here it's the same on all three stills it goes through the pump down underneath here and then into the plate heat exchanger where we feed steam on the other side. So these are called, they're, they're plate heat exchangers, we call them reboilers. And what the steam is doing is we, we maintain a steady rate of steam, a, a steady steam track on, on the reboiler. And when the vapor 
uh, sorry, when the liquid goes back into the still, it then vaporizes instantly and all of your al alcohol then goes up into the neck. But um, like I mentioned before, it's a really clean way of distilling and we're able to do the, um, the CIP on the wash still um, is very simple compared to sending people into stills. I'm going to let Dave take over here because I've got a bit of a walk to the warehouse. So. Okay, um, ho hopefully everybody can see my screen again. Yeah, I think that's okay. And I just noticed, sorry, Alan Matthews said here his wife, his wife's mother and father used to work in the factory back in the 70s. Um, so, the, so the factory itself, it was, built, it was built in the 1960s by an Italian company called Snea. And Snea made, um, essentially, it, 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 they made a material called rayon, which is artificial silk. So it would have been used after the war for things like parachutes and stuff like that. Um, so, so Snead themselves were an armaments business. They made explosives and so on. But in Ireland, in this factory, they, they only made uh, rayon and they and they sold that. Um, the the, the Snead were there for about twenty years, and and then they left Ireland, and the factory was sold to a company called Sahan Media. Most people would know this as as uh, as as the Sahan Media factory. Um, it's it was six acres in size, and this is what it looked like when we when we originally bought it. Um, it, 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 it had housed at one stage up to nine hundred workers, and they made all VHS uh, videotapes and um, about forty percent VHS tapes, and a significant portion of computer reel to reel tapes were, were manufactured in this factory. So that's that, that's what they were doing. So this is what it looked like the day that we um, the, the day that we bought it. Um, and then inside, this is what the building looked like. So you can see this is the this is the distilling hall that you were just that Ollie just showed you around, and this was the sort of condition that it was in when we when we bought it. As was the rest of the six acres. So all of the air air handling units and so on had just been pulled out and dumped on the floor. A lot of concrete columns knocked down um, and so on. Um, this is the, this is actually the distillery hall. So this is a view when Ollie was showing you. The, a picture of all the fermentation tanks looking backwards. That's actually what you were looking at. That's what it would. That's what the, the building was like before we before we renovated it. So it, it, it was quite dilapidated. And um, the, the building is it's about half a kilometer long, um, and it's it's broken down into a number of warehouses. We're repartitioning the warehouses to make seventeen warehouses in total, and that will store one hundred and sixty-five thousand barrels of whiskey. We we make um, seven thousand barrels a year. So so as Ollie was saying, it's it, we're we're, ma we're making a million liters of alcohol. So that's that's a million liters of pure alcohol at one hundred percent. But obviously, it's coming off the last pot still at eighty percent, and it's going into barrels at sixty-three and a half percent. So. If you work out the numbers, it works out that a million liters of alcohol is about three million bottles of whiskey, which is what the current plant is capable of doing. And then the planning permission we have enables us to put a second plant in the middle. So in those open spaces that you were looking at, and that takes the total capacity to just over three million liters of alcohol or 10 million bottles of, of whiskey, which makes it one of the biggest distilleries or certainly the biggest craft distillery in the country. And certainly the, the biggest one that's only making sil single malt and nothing else. Um, and then this is the building as it is today, what it looks like. So you've got the house in the foreground, which we're gradually going through um, the renovation process. And then you've got the distillery, which Ollie showed you, which is that black bit to the front right hand side. So that is the entire distillery under that roof there. And then all of the rest of the building is, is going to be filled with barrels of whiskey. To give you an idea of the size of it, that's half a kilometer from end to end. And that building at the back, the sort of purpley color building, that's nine stories tall. So, so it's, it's, it's a massive building and, 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 and the biggest, as I say, the biggest in the West of Ireland. So Ollie has after, Ollie's after making his way from, from the distillery here in, in the, black, the black bit where you can see the three pot stills all the way over to the left, to, this, to, the, to that warehouse on the, on the back left-hand side. And that's where all of our current stock is stored. So we'll, we'll hand back to Ollie at this stage. Hi, Ali, can you hear us? Yeah, and I just want to apologize first for the uh, for the light in here. The, the the light is the lights in here are really strange. So I've put up like a real dodgy LED there in behind the the screen. So it's slightly better, but <laughs> apologies for that. Is that um, like yeah, so I, hope, I think you can. See. 
Sorry, I missed that. I missed that link. It was just a bad joke. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. You can tell plenty of them as well. Um, I thought I just had, I have the, the trilogy pack here as well that I was going to show everybody. Um, this is this is the first the first trilogy that Dave was showing. He showed pictures of earlier, so you can see there's a, th these come in a, a wooden case, and then these are the three whiskies that we've tried so far. So Anakuna, um, Nopri, and then Kishkarin, and um, I'll pull them out. As Dave said, they're like a book when you open them up. The packaging is fantastic on these, and there's your whiskey. Can you see that? Yeah, it looks great. I know the lighting is terrible, but. Uh, Danny was looking for a I'm just going to shove that out of the way. Sorry, go ahead, Luke. No, I was saying if anyone on the Zoom is looking for me a birthday present, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I think I've kind of killed some of the lighting there as well, but you can see in behind me, this is that's basically all the stock that we made last year. Um, this warehouse, I think by the end of this year, is going to be chock a block. So, um, and then we have two new warehouses down the back of the factory that we're converting um, into into the new two thousand liter uh, two thousand square meter pods that that'll become the two next bond of warehouses. But I think there's there's planning in here for about fourteen warehouses it equals you know one hundred and fifty thousand barrels of whiskey to be stored in here. And um, we'll be storing for other people as well, so but, which we already do. So we store we store the Pat Rigney stock um, from the shed distillery as well, and we have some some other stock from Lockery there as well. But um, I'm sure you want to get onto the final whiskey. I ha mine is just in a sample bottle here. I hope yours is in something a little a little nicer looking. But um, not really. <laughs> what's written What's written on yours there, Luke? There's next trilogy sample. Next trilogy sample. Okay, yeah. So as Dave mentioned earlier, we have the, the first trilogy is the creation trilogy. That's the three that you've tasted there. And then later on this year, we'll be releasing another three. So, um, so far, what we're looking at is a Madeira finish, Sultone finish, and a Tawny Port. Um, those three are definitely sort of developing the best so far. We also have Virgin Oak, uh, Muscat, um, and Tokai Burgundy, and there's some other casks there as well that we, you know, we we're we're, we're looking to do single cask releases as well. So Pedro Jimenez um, and some really nice Oloroso um, hogsheads, as I mentioned earlier. So this one, and I'm going to use you again, Luke, on this one. But um, Madeira, obviously, fruitcake is what you're going to get with this one. Mine's a little cold at the moment because it's always freezing cold in the warehouse. But um, fruitcake, I get on this one, you do get the, you get the vanilla, apples and pears again. I sometimes get pencils on this, you know, like, um, like a fresh pack of pencils, which I know is a, a bit of a strange one, but people get all sorts of random stuff in there on their nose. Let me know if anyone else gets it. It's, um, I'm not, um, but not it's, sure. it is floral as well. It's grassy. I'm not sure I'd know what a pack of pencils smelt like. It's been so long <laughs> since I smelt them, but I'm, I'm sure that's a great taste to know. Colm says almond in the, in the chat. It's definitely, got, it's definitely got a nutty component. I think it's quite yep. orangey as well, kind of like, like orange zest um, as well. Yeah, yeah, I get that in the, in the, in the flavour, yeah. I get that in the that was on That's in my notes for, for the palate, for sure. Wow, it's really, really different on the, on the palate. Mm. It's almost like a, mm. a, a, a I, I, to be honest. I don't remember what strength this is. I think it's around forty-eight. It says. Um, I tell you. I what, think this is uh, around forty-eight as well. I I can't remember. On the bottles that were sent down to us, I think it says forty-eight percent ish or something like that. It's like or or it's, it it sort of says roughly yeah or something along those lines. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Because I, I made it up as a sample, like you know, it was it was made up as a sample. But um, <laughs> you know, it's very it's it's very difficult to make up a sample of say five liters of of spirit and get it to the, exactly the right uh, ABV. So I I sort of went um, in and around forty eight. I was thinking it's, it's it's obviously unfiltered as well. We whereas the other three are all chilled filtered. So it does it 
it, it is kind of it's straight from the cask. It's just had some um, reverse osmosis water added to it to cut it back. Um, I think it started at around 58 or just over 58 percent out of the cask, and then I've I've just put some water in it to cut it back a little bit. Ali, we... yeah, this is it's, it's very warming. I think like, it's really lovely and warm when you when you taste this one. Sorry, Dave. I was just going to say, um, Colin has asked a question here about the, um, I suppose, the leftover waste streams and, and what they're used for. Yeah, actually, sorry, I saw a, I saw a comment as I was walking across here as well. Uh, somebody was asking about the, the sustainability um, and how much water it takes to produce a liter of whiskey. And to be honest, I have no idea, but I'm sure it's an awful lot. I, I must, I must actually calculate it someday. But I guess when you take into mashing, how much water we're using and mashing the losses in in your pot ale, but we use a lot of water in cooling, uh, you know, in the cooling tower as well. So I must work that out someday and find out. But um, yeah, so our waste streams. Um, at, at currently, anyway, um, all, all of the the, the draft, uh, so the spent grains and the pot ale are all going for, for animal feed. Um, they're being taken down to a farm in Tipperary. There's, a, there's a, a company that come and take that away for us. And then the spent leaves, our washings and our CIP waste are going to anaerobic digestion um, not far from here, Balatadrine. And um, yeah, they're, they're using it to create the biogas. So I guess in, a, in an ideal world, we would love to have done that here as well, but those plants are extremely expensive to set up and very difficult to run as well. So we'll, um, we'll continue doing what we're doing f for now anyway. And just like somebody, somebody just on this, while, while we're talking about sort of sustainability and so on, some of the other things as, as, Ali, as Ali, you know, hopefully got across, all of our all of our heat is we use heat exchangers to essentially take the heat back out of the process and store it for use the following day. So wherever possible, we're trying to reuse, you know, and 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 you know increase the efficiency of the plant. We're also doing things like the estate itself. Um, in front of the house, there's an eight acre um, there, there's an eight acre field which we've we've just planted in last week with spring barley. So that'll be ready in August. Um, and we, we're going to make a single estate whiskey using that. We have another 20 acres down by the side of the river, which we're going to... So this year we've we've worked on um, drainage on the field and so on. So we, we'll end up with about 30 to 35 acres of our own barley, which once a year we'll use to make a single estate whiskey, which is, is sort of pretty unique. So for, you know, for a single distillery in Ireland, we'd be able to take the water out of the ground, we'd be able to take barley from the fields, we'd be able to distill it on site, and we'd be able to match, mature it for 20 years in the same location. So it will never leave um, the Lockhill distillery until it's put into a bottle. So, so it, I don't think there's any other distillery that, that you know, that can do that. Um, in terms of the reason we went for something of this size, because it's, you know, on the face of it, it might look a bit bizarre, um, but the reality is there's an awful lot of craft distillery setting up and they're essentially all in competition with each other. Um, we want to do something that was a bit larger so that it would give us uh, additional capacity. Um, but we also want to stick with only making single malts. So we don't have any column stills. We don't do grain whiskey. We don't make any gin. We don't make any vodka. The only thing that we, that we make is single malt whiskey, nothing else. And we want to make the best, the most beautiful single malt whiskey in Ireland. That, that's sort of the company's sort of stated aim. Um, we're about to launch a barrel program so people can buy a barrel of our whiskey, but actually participate in the distillery itself. And everything that you've seen then tonight, you can come and visit with your friends and you can take the tour with Ollie and you can see how it's all done. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a big lofty goal. And then all of the profits from it are plowed back into the estate itself. So we're going to rebuild Hazelwood House and the estate back to the way it was and, and then open the whole lot to the public. Um, so it's a lo it's a long term vision, probably take another you know twenty years to see it through to the end. Um, and on on that 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 line, I suppose going back to the sustainability, Alan Matthew says you're also saving in by reusing an existing factory rather than building on a greenfield site. Um, so that's good as well. Um, you kind of touched on it there, but David did say in terms of um, your volume because because of the scale you're operating on, do you have any certain target markets in particular? Um, is there a plan for 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 a kind of marketing to, to emerging you know i know a lot of new arsenal's target you know taiwan for example or, or these emerging markets for us whiskey 
Yeah, like we currently we currently sell in places like Germany and so on. But at the moment, the, at, at the moment, really, the, the, from a marketing perspective, we've only got a limited number of bottles. So each of these releases of whiskey is six thousand six hundred bottles. So it's very small. And um, so, for example, a single order into America would use all of that stock, or or a single a single you know single order in the Chinese market. So it's actually you know there's, there's some markets that we're just too small for. Um, so in the initial stage, it's all about us getting the whiskey out there, which allows, um, you know, allows people to sort of become aware of the brand and what we're trying to do. And then really, it's probably 10 years down the road before we have our own whiskey and we're in, in a position to supply single malt at scale. So it, it, look, it is a long term project and there's no particular markets at the moment. It, for us, it's about getting it into the hands of people that are really interested in whiskey. So so that everyone starts talking about what, what, what we're doing. And really, you know, setting the scene, I suppose, for something in ten years' time. But the, but at that point, then you're into all the usual markets, such as, as you say, Taiwan, uh, you know, France, uh, you know, America, South America, etc. Um, and David, um, Damien Flynn, who was sticking with the theme of, of the distillery um, project in, in general, he says, are, are you able to dis disclose the financial scale of the project to date, or is that something that you you, you talk about, or is that all? under wraps <laughs> it's, not, not, it's not that it's under wraps i mean look at the look at the investment today it's substantial so you, you know you're well north of 10 million in terms of in, in in terms of investment just in the site itself and so yeah it's a significant build and but it's so you know it's it, it it's going to take yeah it's going to take a lot of money over the next couple of years so so everything that we do in terms of sales in terms of barrels and so on is just plowed back into in in, in into the site um, and and we will do that for years and uh, you mentioned sales there. When when's the next trilogy sample? Did you say November? Is that when you plan to have it out? Yeah, ho ho hopefully before the end of this year. So so um, it, I I think the thing about our whiskey and you you won't get it until until you sit down and sort of look at the website and start reading about it. But for example, the stories that are on. So we so we took. We, we, we took um, nine stories of Celtic mythology. The first three are about how Ireland was created. So it's the story, it's the story of um, um, Dermot and Grania, which everyone would know, like the two Irish lovers and the boar of Ben Bulban, who gored um, Dermot. Um, and, and obviously that's on Ben Bulban Mountain, which you just saw earlier on. So, so, so hence the rationale for that. Um, Lady Cassare was the, was the, was the, the niece of Noah of Noah's Ark and she sailed out of the Mediterranean. She tried to get onto the Ark and wasn't allowed on by the by the uncle. So she sailed out of the Mediterranean with three ships, crash landed in Dunamark, and and one of the ships survived. Dunamark is actually Slogger Bay. So that's why we call it's it's called Knock Nock which is the mountain that you can see on the mount on the seaside of Sligo, you can see that mountain. And then her son was uh, or became King Cormac, uh, the you know the the the, the wolf uh, shapeshifter. So so they're all genuine Celtic myths. They were they were written down in a book in the 13th century in in on the board in a monastery on the border of Sligo and Donegal in a book called the Annals of the Four Masters. So all these stories that you would have learned in in school, uh, that's where they all came from from Sligo, and that's why they're on that. The, the box but what we did was we got a local historian to write stories for us in a joycean style and um, so if you actually buy one of the boxes or if you, if you get one and have a look at it or if you go onto our website you won't understand the story it makes no sense whatsoever but then you can listen to him explaining it to you and he explains it line by line what every line means and and, and how it came about and then we got david kit to put it all to music so so there's a whole load of irish traditions all <laughs> that whiskey and it's layers upon layers that you only get when you and, 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 and understand it but that's what we felt whiskey was all about it's all about storytelling and you know it, it's all about these Irish traditions and sort of sitting around talking about things and, and that's what our whiskey is, is really all about and that's the whole branding No that's, that sounds excellent it's, a, it's an ambitious uh, ask when you ask someone to go you make it a Joycean style <laughs> I mean, to, um, but, but you know fair play um, David says uh, when, when, when you're the kind of current phase of the project is, is over do you fancy focusing on on tour side? Will there be a visitor center? Yeah. So, so what we have is so so basically the, the site is a coma um, regulated site. So there's so much alcohol there that um, it falls under these regulations, the EU regulations that limit the amount of people and visitors that can actually come on site. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring people to the house itself. So we're currently converting. Um, 
the, the ground floor of the house to handle whiskey tours. And from there, then people will be brought down to distillery and brought around. Um, anyone that gets involved in their barrel program buys a barrel of whiskey, they'll be able to bring their friends um, and essentially get sort of all areas access, pri private tours, et cetera. So really, really be treated as if they're an owner of the distillery. And that will allow them to sort of see the house, uh, you know, go down into the warehouse, experience the angel shares, all, all, all that type of thing. But there, yeah, there is, there is plans for full uh, visitor center and um, the, the distillery itself, it's designed in such a way that you can walk around. It, it, it's very hard to see on the video that Ollie was doing because when he was walking up and down those gantries, the stairwells, um, when people come on site, they don't do that. They actually, they walk through, there's, there's, there's whole sections of the walls that are sort of temporarily filled in, but the gantries actually, actually go through those walls and around the back. So what it means is that someone's doing a guided tour, they'll, 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 for example, stand around the lauter ton, but they won't be able to see the rest of the plant. And then when we bring them into the fermentation area, they won't see the pot stills. They'll walk through the wall and come out up, up where the pot stills are, and then that will be revealed to them. So it's all been designed from the beginning to handle tours, but to do it in a way that's a bit unique and a bit different to, to most other distilleries. And we have the, the space to allow us to do that. And is the, is the, is the plan with the house to, to have it like a, a guest house that people stay there like like Eccleville no. style or no? Okay. No, so so what it'll be is it's divided into it's divided into three sections. So one, one section is a museum that will be dedicated to the, the life and the works of Richard Cassell, the architect. The second will be a museum that's dedicated to the Wynn family and the stories of the, you know, the big Anglo-Irish house. And then the third part of it will be all of the tasting rooms and, you know, areas for, you know, photographs, that type, type of thing. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be it'll divided into those three. We also have plans to put a bar into the um, in, into the distillery itself. And then from the bar, there will be a square staircase down into a Dunwich warehouse. And that's where people will be able to go. So someone, someone bring their friends will be able to go into a bar, sit on really comfortable leather sofas, and then bring their friends downstairs into a, an old style Dunwich warehouse to see their barrel and to try to, to taste their own whiskey. Mm. Yeah. And, and then what we'll also do is we're going to take samples of, every, of of each year's barrels of whiskey and store them permanently so when people come to see their whiskey they'll if they don't visit for five years they'll be able to taste the whiskey as it was on year one year two year three year four year five and they'll be able to see how it's matured and um, so that's that, that that that's the plan um excellent um ec says would there be scope to develop a whiskey uh for a woman named after queen Maeve, uh who was buried in the sligo region Possibly, she's actually on. The, she's buried on a cairn on the top of uh, Knock Ray, um, and supposedly standing upright with her, um, with her ar an arrow in her hand, pointed towards her enemies, which were, were up in Ulster. Um, but yeah, she's she's on a cairn on top of Knock Ray, um, but there's seven there's seven mountains around Hazelwood House that all have cairns on top of them, and Hazelwood sits at the centre of those. So it used to be a forest that was frequented by druids and so on. And uh, the, you know, actually, WB8 um, was in in the house quite a lot and frequented uh, Hazelwood Forest and wrote, wrote actually wrote a poem. The, the song of Wandering Angus is about Hazelwood itself. Oh wow! And obviously, um, Loch Gill are, are leaning in a bit to the Queen Maeve um, theme, so you might have some competition there in that regard. Um, <laughs> um, the sorry, I had the next question there in front of me. Um, um, Colm says, put me down for a cask. So you, you, you've, you've sold him there. Um, Michelle says, absolutely love the stories. Um, I live at the foot of, of Knock uh, Fantastic. Um, David says, love some David Kitt. Uh, Going to have to check that music. Uh, the big romance of whiskey. Um, if you click, if, if, you go onto our, if you go onto our website and you go in and look up the whiskies themselves, you'll be brought to a page that has the story and you'll see all the, all the notes about it. And then there's, a, there, there, there's a, 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 an icon that you can click on that will actually play. You'll hear the story being read to the music of David Kitt. So you can, you can go in and have a look at it on our website if you want. Um, excellent. And BK says, uh, how much would a barrel of whiskey cost in your barrel program? Do you know that yet? will be revealed in the next in the next two weeks it's it's a it's a hot topic in the in the whiskey world at the moment um all the, the different prices coming up for, for for barrel projects so so we'll 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 anticipate that one um uh fdv fvdv says thanks for the tour and the tasting look forward to a visit in the future some project um well done um so yeah i suppose that's uh I suppose we, we're, we're coming to the end now and if, maybe if anyone wants to get some last minute questions in, but it's, uh, it's been a fantastic tour, guys. There's, 
really, really enjoyed it. It's, it's definitely been one of our, our more higher quality tastings, I, I must say. Um, just before I, I the after this first um, trilogy, it feels like it's been around a while. When, when, when did that one first launch? So it's maybe, I suppose about a year and a half ago, um, maybe, maybe maybe two years. So it was it was a 14 year old. So what you've tasted, the last whiskey that we tasted was was 16 year old. So it's mm. there's two years in the difference. And is yeah. the plan to wait that long for the for the third and so yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, really, really what we were trying to do was the creation trilogy was to coincide with the creation of uh, of our distillery. Then the next the next trilogy is called the Odyssey trilogy, and it's to essentially a journey. So it's it's essentially to be released in parallel with the production of our whiskey. And then the last trilogy is called the Homecoming trilogy, and it's to coincide with the sort of you know three three ish year anniversary, which will be the you know our our distillery you know our whiskey coming home. So so they're the three trilogies. So really, really every every two years was was what the plan is. Um, somebody's looking for the website, so it's www.athru.com, A-T-H-R-U.com, and you can get all the information there. You can register if you want to register online. We'll send you out links um, and you know emails and keep you up to date with the project. No, it's a, it's a great website. I had, a, I had a, an old Google earlier on in preparation for tonight and had a look through it, and it, it, it looks, looks really, really top quality. Like, you know, and it's those kind of touches, especially with Irish whiskey being such an international audience and everything. People, you know, new, new distilleries, Tend to often neglect that kind of side of things, and it's 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 you know, but you, you obviously haven't in this case. Um, no, it's it's been fantastic. And and just before the on the that first trilogy, what was your? I know we asked about the future markets for your whiskey. Where where was was it mostly a domestic focus? What was your for for this current batch? What was the the kind of focus? Because I suppose no, we sell it. We, whiskey, we, you know, it's over twenty thousand bottles, I suppose, in total. Like you know, yeah, like we sell it. We sell it in France, in Italy, in Germany. Um, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Um, we're looking at the American market at the moment. So uh, the UK, obviously, um, and then in Ireland. Uh, but it's, it's small quantities. Like, you know, we don't, we don't sell it in volume. So, you know, people tend to buy a pallet or so, a couple of pallets. Um, it, but really what we want to do is we want to get it out to, out to people. We're not, we're not really interested in selling. Like, even if we sold out, we don't make much money on it. It's more about getting the brand out there, getting people to try the whiskey, so that so that the brand is firmly established by the time we have our own whiskey ready. And you're going to stick with the Athru branding when you have your own distillate of age, is it? Yeah, and what you, what 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 anyone who if you look closely at the package, what you'll notice what you'll notice is these whiskies all have the word first edition on them, mm -hmm. and the reason for that is obviously they're first editions. To, uh, you know, we're producing that, but much like a book, we can do a reprint. So the whole the whole idea is if you if you think about it, um, our Anacuna whiskey is a mixed. Well, it's it's whiskey that's been finished in Oloroso sherry casks and Pedro Jimenez sherry casks, a combination seventy percent, thirty percent. So at some stage we will effectively do a reprint using our own whiskey and we'll, we'll reprint that whiskey in, in bigger volume and that will ena enable us to say sell it into the, into the American market. So that's really, the plan is to take the nine core whiskies and expand on that. What we're also doing, um, which will, will be coinciding with our cast program, we're also releasing single barrel whiskies, so single barrel or single cast bottlings. Um, so that's where Ollie's gonna go into the warehouse pick out his favorite barrel and we're just going to bottle whatever's in it at, at cask strength um, and people can try it. So in some cases it might be only, you know, 150 bottles or maybe, you know, if, if out of a sherry, but maybe up as far as 400 bottles. Um, but we'll, we'll start, we're going to start that in the next sort of two or three weeks. Um, I suppose uh, there's another question came in there where, where Michael um, says, when you spend five years working on a whiskey after buying the raw product, what do you do to turn it into the finished whiskey? And you mentioned about sourcing the, the Tokai casks through the Hungarian ambassador. Do you have um, sort of established links that you work with in terms of cask sourcing? Is it, yeah. is it so what we do bridges or? Yes, yeah, so we work. So we buy directly from um, we we buy directly from the manufacturers. So yeah, there are there are cooperages that do like they essentially brokers that will you know you can you can buy from. Um, we go direct to source, so we're going to bodegas in Jerez in Spain, and we're buying um, Oloroso sherry casks from them. And in fact, like I've just re read in the last couple of weeks, that the whiskey markets become so lucrative that the sherry producers are actually making sherry to put into barrels to throw out the sherry, so they can sell the barrels to Irish and Scotch uh, whiskey companies. 
Um, so, so the bar, the you know, the, the the barrels have become more more valuable than the actual sherry itself. And um, but we deal directly with with the with the bodegas and we just buy them buy them indirect. And then all the unusual casts, we'd we'd often get approached by distiller or sorry vineyards and so on to say that they have you know particular type of casks or something that's a bit unusual and do, are we interested in buying those and we, we may buy them in and put the whiskey into that in terms of the finished product um what we what we what we do is we take so the whiskey the whiskey comes out um in in the barrel it's it's essentially disgorged um out of the barrel and there's a sort of a wire mesh to capture anything like all the barrels are, are all the barrels are charcoal finished on the inside well particularly the bourbon ones so you're going to end up with bits of charcoal in the whiskey itself so when they're disgorged and um, they go through a fine mesh that sort of takes that out and um, then they go into a much larger tank and we we, we might put 10 or 20 and um, barrels m- maybe even more into a tank where they're all mixed up so you get a certain amount of consistency um, then if the if the whiskey has to be chill filtered, what we'll do is we'll reduce uh, the, the the temperature of the of the liquid to about two or three degrees, and then we pass it through a filter and then bring it back up to room temperature. What the chill filtering does, a lot of people uh, don't like if they if the if whiskey is non chill filtered when you put when you pour it over an ice cube it goes cloudy and people think there's something wrong with it. Um, so what chill filtering does is it takes the cloudiness out of the whiskey so that when you do pour it out it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't cloud over. And then I suppose whiskey aficionados would say that that's actually removing some of the flavor. So some whiskies are chill filtered and some non-chill filtered. And that's really down to the distiller or the blender will make that decision. So in our case, um, uh, Billy wanted the whiskey to be chill filtered. So so we, we chill filter the whiskey. We then take the um, the whiskey and we add, we add uh, water, pure water uh, that's been purified by reverse osmosis, that gets added into the final product to bring the alcohol content to what we want. So we would have, at, I, I, Ollie would, when Ollie was going through, like what comes off the last spirit still is at about 80% alcohol by volume. We mix it with water and put it into the casks at exactly 63.5% ABV. And then over a 10 year period, the alcohol content, alcohol evaporates quicker than water. So the alcohol content reduces over time. So within 10 years, it'll be at around 58 or 59% ABV. So that's why when you're taste, tasting cast strength whiskey, it's, it's around 58, 59, 60%, uh, depending on the age of it. And then we would, we would water that down with, uh, say, reverse osmosis purified water to bring it down to what we want to bottle it at. And in this, in this particular case, all three whiskies are bottled at, at 48% alcohol by volume. But that, that's the blender's choice. That's what Billy wanted. But he could have said 42%, 46%, whatever. For, for it to be Irish whiskey, it has to be above, I think it's 40% mm-hmm. AB, but from there upwards. Um, so, so yeah, so, so all, all we do is disgorge it, uh, purify it and mix it with water and then put it into bottles. There's not, there's nothing else involved. No, fantastic. And I suppose also you were talking about the, the, the chill filtration. If you bring it down to, to, I think it's below 43%, you almost have to chill filtrate it because those, those, those heavy fats and, and oils in it become too unstable at that point. So I suppose that's why it's, it's so such an industry standard, because obviously this is 48%. It's quite a unique volume to be, to be bottling at you know um yeah. even even the ones that bottle over 40 40 percent it tends to be 43 and 46 so um was there a reason behind 48 and why not 46 or 43 or what was just, the logic no i think the logic was pa- um, um um billy would have tasted the whiskey and just decided that that he thinks that particular whiskey should be bottled at, at that strength and um, that's why when you add water like so when you put a little dr- drop of water a lot of people would add water using a um a straw so you know put put a straw into in, in, into some water and put your finger over the top of it. So you use like a pipette and t- drop the tiniest bit of water in. But what it does is it changes the surface tension on the whiskey and it releases um, additional vapors or so on. So so Billy wanted it at 48% so that people could add water and, and you know, and, and run that process. Mm-hmm. No, it is good. And, and yeah, no, it's always a, when you take time and, and add small, small bit after small bit, peeling the layers back, it's, it's always a, it's always great fun. So, no, it is fantastic. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, to share with, with everyone who's left on the, the Zoom before we finish? Or No, just really appreciate people taking the time out. I know everybody's busy at the moment. Um, so really, really appreciate people taking the time out to, to, to listen to what, we're, what we were talking about. I hope everybody enjoyed it. No, I think, I think we did. I know I certainly did. And we, like we've done 
think over well over 50 of these um tastings since last august and this is definitely up there with, with some of the best the, the in terms of both quality of the whiskey and the quality of the, the presentation so so thank you um guys it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic um there's already as you i'm sure you can see some great comments came in there about, about how great the tasting was so thanks very much and and as always if there's anyone listening who has questions that they weren't brave enough to type in or that i missed or or that that come to mind later on tonight just send me an email and, and um, I'll pass them on to David and Ali and make sure everything gets gets answered accordingly um, and all that. And all these are, the first three are still available at CelticWhiskeyShop.com, 132 euros, which is, a, I think that's, that's as I mentioned at the start of the, the chat when we did the first whiskey, I think that's good quality, good price for, for what they are in this in this current climate where Irish whiskey has gone uh, a bit dulali in some prices. So um, brilliant. Thanks Thank very you. much, folks. Thanks, guys. Thank Cheers. you. To see it.